It's Friday, May 29. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says he is pleased by the spirit of determination displayed by the global leaders and institutions. Addressing the closing session of a high-level digital meeting, which he co-convened with the United Nations General Secretary Antonio Guterres and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Thursday, Mr. Holness said he applauds efforts to rescue economies and societies from the devastating economic and human impacts of a COVID. I am encouraged that we have achieved what we have aspired to do at this global dialogue, which is to set in motion a process to identify concrete solutions to the various challenges presented by the COVID-19 crisis. We, the conveners, value the views and perspectives that were expressed today, which will inform the process of creating a global response to the most challenging crisis of our time. We call on all key actors in this process to take decisive action to ensure that all countries recover and emerge stronger and more resilient from this unprecedented crisis. The virtual meeting was aimed at advancing concrete solutions to the development of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many practical ideas were raised today, which should give us hope that together we will find creative and collective solutions. We must carry this sense of urgency and solidarity on the road ahead. The tremendous participation today and the ideas we have heard show how important it is that we have a truly global conversation about how to defeat this pandemic and rebuild in its wake, but also that we take concrete action to do just that. I'm encouraged that we'll work together in six critical areas as it was referred. First, finding ways to enhance global liquidity so that developing countries have the resources they need to fight the pandemic. Second, preventing debt crises in all countries at risk, including middle-income countries. Such crises risk undermining both the COVID-19 response and sustainable development for years to come. Third, engaging with private creditors on joint debt relief efforts. Fourth, aligning global financial systems with the Sustainable Development Goals. Fifth, ending illicit financial flows. And sixth, rebuilding differently and better. Jamaica's long-term National Development Plan Vision 2030 is being reviewed in light of the impact of the novel coronavirus pandemic. Vision 2030 aims to position Jamaica to achieve developed country status and in the process make it the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. Director General of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, Dr. Wayne Henry, spoke to the review at a press conference earlier this week. Jamaica's National Development Planning Framework is geared towards the achievement of our national goals and the global goals to which we have committed, and forms the framework for our participation in global agreements and forums on development. Jamaica remains committed to pursuing the long-term goals articulated in Vision 2030 Jamaica, the National Development Plan. However, in the face of COVID-19, strategic actions required in the medium to long term to realize our goals and maintain that path will require review and revision. This includes revisiting the development targets up to 2030 and the period or schedule for achieving these planned outcomes and our national development goals. This process has commenced with government-led strategic actions and plans from various sectors, including program revisions and reviews in an effort to adapt to the challenges, shocks, and risks presented by the global pandemic. We are not yet in a position to present revised long-term development targets. However, from the PIOJ's preliminary review of the development targets under Vision 2030 Jamaica, it is anticipated that based on projections for the Jamaican and wider global society and economy, there will be slippages in several indicators. These include real gross domestic product, GDP, annual growth rate, and nominal GDP per capita, the unemployment rate, and poverty prevalence rates. 
Minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries, J.C. Hutchinson, says that 400 acres of land has been allocated to establish an agroeconomic zone in St. Thomas. The minister says the land was made available following discussions with Sugar Company of Jamaica's managing director. I've had discussions with Mr. Shukir and he has allocated 400 acres of land for the farmers over here to go into production right away. What we need is as crops, cash crops, in other words, small farmers, all of these small farmers who you have here. We are saying if you are cultivating, no one you're doing well, you stay on the land and you cultivate. Those, Mr. MP, Mr. MP, just follow me, just follow me, just follow me. No, you listen to me. I am saying to you, Mr. MP. Yes, I, I, I am publicly saying it. We have had it operating in Holland. Right? And you have heard about it. Right. So therefore, all I am saying, we want to replicate it. We're doing, we're doing it in Trelawney. We want to carry it to St. Thomas. Absolutely. So therefore, I am with you in making sure that it happens. The minister was in the parish earlier this week along with Member of Parliament Dr. Fenton Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson welcomed this news as the divestment of the Dockinsfield Sugar Factory has left an economic gap in this agro belt. As it relates to the agro economic zone, all I want to know, Minister, is that what you are saying, it is the same thing that Minister Shaw is saying, is the same thing that Minister Green is saying, is the same thing your pace is saying, and is the same thing the cabinet is saying. Because in the end, if we are able to do what you have expounded, it is in keeping with where we are looking. And also recently some farmers complained of being threatened to vacate their lands which they farmed for cash crops. Yes, so they want to move me from, from here? The water. Because, yes, uh, right? So, I don't know, this man come and say they want to raise coal. Cow. Yeah, cow they wanted to raise cow. Yeah, right. So what I'm told you eat for you eat food? Minister Hutchinson and Dr. Ferguson did a brief tour of the area. The government has previously established agroeconomic zones in Trelawney and St. Elizabeth. The University of the West Indies is to adjust its matriculation requirements for prospective students in the upcoming academic year 2020-2021 due to the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. In a memorandum issued to campus principals, deans and registrars on Tuesday, the UWI said the decision followed a secret ballot exercise. 14 of 21 members voted to ease the entry requirements and none opposed. With the relaxed matriculation requirements, students who have passed at least two Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination subjects, either at Unit 1 or Unit 2 with grades 1 to 4, the requisite Caribbean Secondary Examination Certificate subjects, and current registration for CAPE Unit 1 and Unit 2 will be eligible. Labor and Social Security Minister Shahini Robinson has died. Ms. Robinson had been missing in action from work, parliament and social engagements for some time. It's understood that she had been fighting cancer and has been in and out of hospital since 2018. The St. Anne Northeast Member of Parliament was visited by Prime Minister Andrew Holness and their cabinet colleague Olivia Babsy Grange earlier this week at her home in Kingston. The minister passed away while the Senate was still in session. On hearing the news, the Upper House observed a moment of silence in her honour. Colleagues, it is, you know, sad in terms of the passing of the Honourable Minister of Labour has taken 
a serious jolt on the entire country and the entire, um, all of us. And it's with sadness that one of our colleagues would have passed whilst we're conducting the nation's business. And I'm lost for words, and I'm sure many of you will. But I think out of the deepest respect, we must rise and offer a moment of silence for our colleague. Tributes continue to flow for former Minister of Social Security and Consumer Affairs, Dr. Neville Gallimore. Dr. Gallimore passed away Thursday morning at age 81. Prime Minister Andrew Honus says Dr. Gallimore was known for his love of God and the church and for his commitment and service to his country. He was an accomplished statesman who was first elected to Parliament in 1967. He served as Parliamentary Secretary for Foreign Affairs from 1969 to 1972, later as Minister of State for Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade between 1980 and 1984, Minister of Social Security and Consumer Affairs from 1986 to 1988, and finally as Minister of Education from 1986 to 1989. Dr. Gallimore was also the Member of Parliament for St. Anne Southwest for over 30 years. Earlier this week, the Planning Institute of Jamaica gave a first quarter report. Gabriel Thompson delves into that report as well as other news from the world of finance in this edition of the Business Report. The Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ, is reporting a 1.7% contraction in the Jamaican economy for the first quarter of 2020. PIOJ Director General Dr. Wayne Henry made the revelation Thursday during the Institute's quarterly press briefing. Today, we are reporting that real gross domestic product, GDP, for the Jamaican economy contracted by an estimated 1.7%. That is, it was negative 1.7% in the January to March 2020 quarter, compared with the corresponding quarter of 2019. This outturn, if it materializes, would have ended an extended period of 20 consecutive quarters of no economic contraction. That is, the economy grew in 19 quarters and remained flat in the October to December 2019 quarter. Dr. Henry outlined factors that led to the contraction of the gross domestic product. The outturn for January to March 2020 largely reflected the impact of, one, the implementation of measures to manage the COVID-19 pandemic commencing in mid-March to include the closure of international borders to the movement of persons which curtailed external demand and essentially halted all tourist-related activities, implementation of curfews, which restricted opening hours of some businesses and adversely impacted the demand for some goods and services, the closure of all schools, and the implementation of general stay-at-home and work-from-home orders. Two, lower capacity utilization within the mining and quarrying industry following the temporary closure of Jamaica's largest alumina refinery in September 2019 to upgrade capacity. And three, a continued slowdown in construction-related activities, consequent on the ending of major road infrastructure projects, the slow startup of new projects, as well as a slowing in building construction activities. The PIOJ head also outlined other sectors affected. The contraction was partially tempered by an uptick in agriculture production, as well as increased manufacturing activities. Real sector developments. Developments in the goods producing industry. 
The goods producing industry contracted by an estimated 1.5% due to a downturn in the mining and quarrying and construction industries. This performance largely reflected the impact of plant downtime and reduced levels of construction activities. These negative factors outweigh the impact of improved weather conditions on agriculture, as well as increased capacity utilization in the manufacturing industry. Agriculture. The agriculture, forestry, and fishing industry grew by an estimated 7.8%. The performance of the industry was facilitated by more favorable weather conditions and increases in hectares reaped and output per hectare. The other agricultural crops group was estimated to have grown by 10.8%. There were increases in seven of the nine crop groups, including fruits up 20.9%, condiments up 16.9%, potatoes up 15.5%, other tubers up 14%, and yams up 11.3%. In Thursday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index declined by 706 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 75 stocks, of which 29 advanced, 33 declined, and 13 traded firm. The Junior Market Index advanced by 47 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, Burita Investments, and Caribbean Cement Company. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper. Trading firm were Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, Dolphin Cove Limited, and Elite Diagnostic Limited. Trans Jamaican Highway Limited was the volume leader with 7.2 million units, followed by Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with 5.7 million units and Mailpack Group Limited with 2.3 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The US dollar on Thursday, May 28 ended trading at $144.09. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $105.89. The pound sterling traded for $178.84 and the euro ended trading at $163.40. Oil prices edged lower on Friday after U.S. inventory data showed lackluster fuel demand in the world's largest oil consumer while worsening U.S.-China tensions weighed on global financial markets. Brent crude futures slipped 25 cents to settle at $35.04 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures were down 53 cents to $33.18 a barrel. And that's it for the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. As we get you ready for the weekend, it's time now for the Entertainment Recap with Alicia Steele. Gone. I'm Alicia and welcome to PBCJ's Entertainment Recap. From Ambition is a privilege where enough man have versus cross the poor people governor. Yes, a Bunty and Beanie took the weekend for themselves. In the versus clash put on by Swiss Beats and Timbaland, Mina has to tell you, it did shot. But have a look. Wee wee, she's on the live. Wee wee, you see me, me. She see wee wee. Come down, person. I make the whole million birds before me set. Put up in the gift that's from the century. Go, go. See this me? We just do something like this. God knows. God knows. God knows. God knows. Good evening. Beaver, the police are here. We have 500,000 people watching this right now. Do you want to be there? Beaver. The police are gone. Bust the man. Hey. Tell that boy, stop watch me close. Stop watch me guy. I'll let go with your business, man. Pass you a lot, Tim, and no bad of a gun with me. I'm not surrounded. 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 I'm not Who 
who's who's of celebrities and even politicians tuned into the live show, like our Honorable Prime Minister, Rihanna, Bojibanton sent emojis of a fire and Jamaican flag, Snoop Dogg, Conscience, Spice, and many more. Self-appointed king of the dancehall, Beanie Man, got a lot of feedbacks, some which we all turn into memes. And he took it great. He turned it into a positive more than a negative and started working out because yes, those feedbacks was memes creating an uh, impact of how his belly was leading his foot. And they turned and he turned it into a great one. Saying, hey, I'm a workout right after this. And so he did. Yes. <laughs> Atlanta star and dance all Queen Spice taught Rashida how to cool it down for her birthday celebration with a few other cast members. They turn up for Rashida's big day. <laughs> Remember to tune in this Sunday, the final Sunday on PBCJ4 Sunday Live featuring Wayne Marshall, Rush Rebel, Sheen. Don't miss it, it's going to be great. Remember, I'm your girl, Alicia, and this is Entertainment Recap. I'm big up to Air Candy Collection from a nice earring, yeah. Follow them too at the Air Candy Collection. And remember, big up you. In regional news, Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley is hailing the government's optional saving scheme as a boss move. We get more in this report. Prime Minister Mia Motley has touted the Barbados Optional Savings Scheme as a boss move and one which will benefit the needs of government, public servants and the country. The program, which is expected to create approximately $100 million in fiscal space for capital spending, replaces the initial forced savings and national meeting plan proposals. Speaking during a press conference at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center last night, the Prime Minister made it clear the program was an optional one and a win-win situation for all. The program is intended to be able to benefit, as I said, the needs of government, which is that we need above the line to be able to recast some of our recurring expenditure and to put in place of it additional capital expenditure so that we can ha undertake aggressively a number of projects that will allow us to be able to increase the number of persons who are working in the country. As of today, um, we had 41,836 unemployment benefit claims. Um, I think I can say if there is good news, it is that it is not increasing at the rate at which it was increasing before. If there is good news, it is that there are at least 500 persons who have gone back um, to their substantive work and not at the, um, not claiming the unemployment benefit anymore. 
Um, when we come to the second part of the press conference, I'll give you more details about the, what we've paid out, etc. But for this point in time, we believe that if we can repurpose close to $100 million of recurring expenditure to capital works, that there will be a greater multiplier effect that will allow more Barbadians to be able to work. Guyana's Attorney General Baza Williams says the Guyana Elections Commission, GCOM, has the authority to resolve all issues of electoral irregularities uncovered in the national recount now on the way. The recount is for the March 2 general and regional elections. Infohub's Alexis Rodney reports. The Attorney General responded Monday to claims by opposition member Anil Nandlal, who, along with other opposition officials, has been pushing the narrative that the probing of the electoral irregularities was outside of the remit of GCOM and that the many objections being made by government counting agents are suited only for an elections petition. Citing the Commission's National Recount Order, A.G. Williams maintained that the provisions empowered GCOM to not only count the ballots but also examine irregularities, discrepancies and anomalies to decide on the credibility, or lack thereof, of the March to polls. The order also provides for the use of the observations report form to record any observation outside of the ballot box checklist. And under paragraph 12, the chief elections officer, after tabulating the matrices of all electoral districts, to submit a report which includes the observation reports and the matrices of the ballot for each district to the commission. Quote, this shows a clear dichotomy between the ballot count and observations being made during the recount process, confirming that it is not about the ballot count alone. Unquote. GCOM's Chair Justice Retired Claudette Singh has already requested from the APNU AFC Coalition evidence of the objections being made in the observation reports. The government said it has evidence to support its objections over the names of deceased persons and persons who were overseas on March 2 turning up to cast their ballots. According to A.G. Williams, GCOM is well equipped with a chairman who is qualified to adjudicate in these matters. Former Director General of the Ministry of the Presidency, Joseph Harmon, has already outlined that over 86,000 votes have been severely affected from attempts at electoral fraud by the opposition. For InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. The demerit points system and the new traffic ticketing system are now in law in Trinidad and Tobago. President Paula May Weeks proclaimed the amendments to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act 2017 on Tuesday. Karen Gozia Philip of TTT News reports. The driver of this pickup van counted his lucky stars on Wednesday as he got away with a warning from licensing officers along the foreshore on the Audrey Jeffers Highway. The vehicle he was driving had no taillights, a faulty ID plate and no ID lights. Under the new demerit points system, these offenses carry a total penalty of $2,450 and nine demerit points. Under the new demerit system, demerit points are electronically calculated and recorded on a driver's driving record. For example, driving 10 to 20 kilometers over the speed limit carries a fine of $1,500 and two demerit points. Driving under the influence of alcohol carries nine demerit points, while an authorized use of the priority bus route carries a fine of $2,000 and six demerit points. An experienced driver with 10 to 14 demerit points over a three-year period can have his or her license suspended for a period of six months. 14 to 20 demerit points can equate to a one-year suspension, while drivers with 20 or more demerit points will have their license suspended for two years. Minister of Works and Transport Rohan Sinanan says the new system is not a revenue earner for the government, but rather it's about a culture change and rehabilitating drivers. I have heard people saying, I am going on the bus route because I could afford to pay the fine. The fine was $2,000, I could waste, I could spend $2,000, so I'm taking a chance. I've heard people say, I speed them because if I get a ticket, I could pay the ticket. Or, I mean, it might be difficult for them to even fine me. The new fixed penalty traffic ticketing system introduces a modern and efficient approach to traffic law enforcement in Trinidad and Tobago. 
It decriminalizes traffic offenses and the traffic violations, introduces an electronic traffic ticketing system or e-tickets, and a new cashless method for paying traffic ticket fines via links, among other features. Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith welcomes the new era of technology. Just a few years ago, my police officers would be hiding behind a lamppost and jumping out with a stick and then having books and writing. This year is not a cell phone. This year is what this is technology and this year will ensure greater efficiency and greater efficiency can... The spot speed camera system and the red light camera system will not be enforced just yet, as these amendments are still being debated in the Parliament. Further information on the demerit points and reform fixed penalty ticketing system can be found at www.drivingtt.com. Karen Cozier Philip, TTT News. In sports, head coach of Sprint Tech Track Club, Maurice Wilson, says his charges will be ready for action when action in athletics resumes in August. The veteran sprint coach says that even though the recent two-week lockdown of St. Catherine, where the club is based, hindered some of his athletes from carrying out basic fitness drills, he thinks they have enough time to work themselves back into shape to take on the European circuit. The lockdown was put into effect to curtail the spread of the coronavirus disease in the area. World Athletics recently announced that its Wanda Diamond League series will resume in the middle of August and will finish in October. And that's the news. Thanks so much for watching PBCJ. Remember, keep safe.